All right, if you have your Bible, why don't you open up to Colossians chapter 1. We're in a week, or we're in our Supremes uh, series, which is a series on Colossians called Supreme Christ Overall. Don't forget our study guides if you have them. would love for you to grab one of these. We have a few paper copies left um, in the back before you leave, or you can download them on our app. That app that Ben Acone just pumped up really big, that app, you can have this as well. And that will help you as you're kind of studying the book together, reading the book together, and taking notes in there as well. As you're turning in your Bibles, let me give you a quick update on something that's really cool this summer. If you remember right, we had our Summer to Feed the Hungry program as a church. And we had a couple projects that we did for that. One was kind of a food drive. We did one here at Woodenville and one over at Bothell as well. And we provided food for various things, Care Day, and for the King County Library System, which was cool to feed people and help them along the way. And then we also did an Eat Give project, which is a really cool way for us to bring these boxes home. And we said every time you go out to eat this summer, as you throw a few dollars in that box to pretend you're buying a meal for someone in Rwanda, one of our sponsored kids or sponsored families there in Bujasera. And so what's really cool is you did that in such an amazing way. In fact, you guys eat out too much. I got to admit, it just is true. You gave a total of $10,591, which is matched by a generous family in our congregation, which gives us $21,182.56 for... <laughs> The ministry, which is amazing. Yeah. This is literally about double what I thought we were going to give for this project. It is amazing. You can pray for us as we're considering what to do. This is overwhelmingly generous from you. And we're trying to figure out what we do because this will pay for all the gardens we wanted to build. It'll pay for all the school supplies that we we're going to buy. And there's other things that we're thinking of as well. So we have a list of things to do there in Bujasera. A uh, partner church in, in Portland area, River West Church, built a, wa- a well there a few years ago and they need to move it. And so that costs several thousand dollars. And so we're thinking about actually helping with that as well, which is kind of a cool deal. As you know, we built that garden there last year, that huge more than a garden, it's a farm there, and we helped kind of irrigate that and whatnot. So there's all kinds of things we can do with that money. But thank you for being generous. It's a really cool to think, thing to see that God is providing those things for you guys as well. All right, let's jump into Colossians this morning and see what the Lord has to say for us. You know, I kind of have my big idea up front today that I want you to think about that is the entire thesis of this passage that we're going to look at. It's one of my favorite in the book of Colossians, and it helps us get a feel for what the book of Colossians is about. And my thesis is this. I think the main battle in your life is seeing Jesus and the gospel as the ultimate treasure in your life. I think that's one of your biggest battles that you face. And I'm not picking on you by saying this. I'm simply telling you that it's difficult to live in our world and to see Jesus as our ultimate treasure and the highest of value in our lives. And there's so many things that vie for our attention, even good things sometimes. Like for myself, sometimes I see myself more as a husband and father than a Christian. It's just because my day-to-day life is filled with husbanding and fathering, if you will. And so it becomes what seems to be kind of an ultimate treasure in my life. And sometimes that actually can distract me from being a strong father and a strong husband even. Because if I don't see Jesus as the ultimate treasure in my life, and I start doing things just for my kids and for my wife, that gets exhausting. But the moment I turn to see Jesus as the ultimate treasure and I start to do everything for him, it reminds me that that is where I gain my power and my strength from as a man, as a husband, as a father. Seeing Jesus as the ultimate treasure becomes my main battle in my life. And I bet you it's yours as well. The distraction of things of this world, whether that's money or job or whatever you might fill in the blank with, is something that gets our attention a lot of the time. And the battle becomes for us to say, Lord, Jesus, I want you to be my treasure. Now, you might say he is a treasure to me, but the question becomes, is he the ultimate treasure? Is he that focused in your life? And I was at my wife's grandfather's memorial yesterday in Albany, Oregon. He was a great man. He was one of the few remaining World War II veterans, a 10th Mountain Division member trained in the mountains of Colorado to fight on skis, believe it or not. And he was injured in the Italian Alps during the Second World War one of those few that are left, which is an amazing thing. His name was Del Riley. He passed away when I was in Myanmar this recent summer, and and it was an amazing time to kind of look over his life. He was 93 years old. My wife's um, parents had kids really, really young, so all my grandparents have been gone for years. But it's amazing to kind of see that she has grandparents left. She still has one more left as well, which is really cool. But we got to know Del throughout the years, and I had a great experience getting to know this man and seeing his heritage and his life. The army sent an honor guard to be at his memorial. 
They played taps. They had a gun salute to him, which is a pretty powerful moment as well as you heard the gunshots in the background. And as they honored him for being a veteran and, and all of those things. The crazy thing is after he came back from World War II, he sold typewriters for a while, but eventually got into public office as well. And he became the county clerk for Lynn County in the Willamette Valley. The amazing thing was knowing that he became an ambassador and visionary for getting vote by mail in the state of Oregon to happen. In fact, he was the one who came up with the idea for vote by mail in the entire country, and now he actually put it on the ballot many years ago, 1981, put it on the ballot for Oregonians to vote on this. As you may know, it passed, and he became the first state that pioneered the, city, or the state of Oregon for vote by mail, which is pretty amazing. I don't know if you know this, but because of Del Riley, we have vote by mail in the state of Washington, which is pretty amazing. The county clerk showed up to his, his uh, funeral yesterday and shared a little bit about this and said how the governor of Oregon, Kate Brown, recently said and thanked Del Riley in his speech because of vote by mail, because of what happened and what he did for the state. The, this Lynn County clerk came in and just shared how much Del was his hero, and it was an amazing thing to see. He said he was a visionary that changed the face of elections in Oregon, Washington, Colorado, and many countries in Utah, excuse me, many counties in Utah and California. And he said the movement is now growing nationally because of Dell. But here's the funny thing. Even with all those accolades, with being a World War II veteran and being in public office for such a time, the most amazing thing was to see that every person who got up didn't share about the things that he did in life, but rather shared about his deep love for Jesus Christ. Every single person got up there and said, Dell would be angry at me today if I didn't tell you that you can have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And it was funny, every single person said this. There were five speakers who spoke about Dell's life, and they all spoke about his unwavering commitment and love for Jesus Christ. Dell was a Gideon. He went and gave Bibles out in Mexico and prisons and schools. And most recently, he stood on the community college of Lynn Benton Community College and handed out Bibles to young people, college students, and led a few to Christ about two months ago before he passed away. An amazing story of being sold out to Jesus Christ. And I sat there yesterday and I watched his memorial and a couple things happened. Number one is I was like, man, I, I hope my legacy is half as much as his when I pass away. Hopefully I make it to 93, and by God's grace, I'll be with my Savior one day, and I'll have a legacy like Dell's. I would love to have that. But more importantly, I thought, man, that guy's ultimate treasure was Jesus. Married for 64 years, doing all this work in life, but really what defined him more than anything else was his relationship with God through Christ. And we saw that. Even with all the things that showed up, Jesus was his ultimate treasure, and it was inspiring. Is Jesus your ultimate treasure? Would you like to get there one day and say, man, I want the people to say about me when I pass away that Jesus was my number one, was the most important part of my life? I hope you do. I hope that becomes your prayer. The entire passage of Colossians 1, 15 through 23 today is inspiring to us to help us make Jesus our ultimate treasure. I want to read you a portion of it this morning. And as we see this, may you experience what I experienced this week, this overwhelming gratitude for who Jesus is and a hope that my life will make him my supreme treasure. Let's see what Paul says. He says this, Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Let's pause there. Virtually all scholars agree that this is a hymn. We don't know whether Paul wrote it or not, or whether he's quoting something that he knew that the Christian community in the early days would say or sing as a hymn. And it's beautiful. It's amazing. And isn't it powerful as you read it? This vision of Jesus Christ. It's possibly one of those things that if you're having a bad day, you should go read this like 10 times to remind yourself of who Jesus is 
and what he is for you as well. It becomes this picture of him being the ultimate treasure of all things. Do you see all those things that it talks about that he is preeminent in all these things? There's an old African-American spiritual song called Give Me Jesus. And it goes like this. In the morning when I rise. In the morning when I rise. In the morning when I rise. Give me Jesus. The refrain says, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. The other verses say, dark midnight was my cry, but give me Jesus. And the final verse says, Oh, when I come to die, give me Jesus. Do you see the the hope of those words? To understand the history of hymnody in the African-American context is to understand that many spirituals and songs were birthed out of trials and struggles in their own lives. Give Me Jesus becomes an excellent example. No one knows who wrote this song, but it came out of the African-American spirituals hymnal. And what's amazing about this is we know the history of that. And we know the history of slavery and, and crisis in the early days. And if this song came out of this and there's so much crisis going on, doesn't that give it some meaning for you to think about? To go, oh my gosh, when everything else is bad, give me Jesus. When dark midnight's my cry, give me Jesus. When I come to die, Give me Jesus. One African-American Lovinia mom painter, the founder and director of the Great Day Choral of New York City, said this in a book about this hymn. She said, anyone who knows Jesus knows that he's simply everything. If you've got him, you've got everything. If you don't have him, you don't have anything. I know what it's like to wake up before dawn and sense his presence in the morning when I rise. I think of the many times the dark midnight was my cry just before the break of day. And in that time, I say once again, give me Jesus. This is the attitude I want. I don't know about you, but I, I want Jesus to be the ultimate treasure in my life. Before in Colossians 1, Paul has already talked about the work of Christ with, rede- with respect to redemption, the gospel, and forgiveness of sins. And in this section, he continues to draw on the person and work of Christ and the cosmic ways and his role in all of creation and in our lives as well. And I would argue that these five verses are the main emphasis of the entire letter. The first part spells out his relationship to God, Jesus' relationship to God. And the second part spells out his relationship to all of creation. And let me propose to you, there's two ideas that we see here. We're going to see one here and then one in the second part. But in this whole section of 15 through 23, I think it comes down to two things. Jesus Christ is supreme, number one. And number two, Jesus Christ is sufficient. Those are the two big ideas. What's the sermon about today? Jesus is the ultimate treasure of my life because he is supreme and he is sufficient. If you can say that when you're watching the football game today and having lunch, I've done my job, all right? Jesus Christ should be the ultimate treasure in my life because he is supreme and he is sufficient. We see this supremeness of Christ in verses 15 through 20. He is over all things, as Paul says here. The confession that Christ is over all becomes the single confession of saying Christianity is your faith. If Christ is over all things, he's the absolute highest of all powers, authorities, and all creation. Paul talks about how he's the image of the invisible God. In other words, Christ is the one who has revealed to us the very nature and character of God. That when we see Jesus, we see God. We see God the Father, and we see the character of God worked out in the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's amazing to think about this, that we have this image of him in our minds, the one who is God. And when we start to think of him in this way as all-powerful, not just as the man who lived on earth, who lived a life of humility, lived a life of being poor, who died on the cross for our sins. Yes, all of that is true, but there's a different picture in Colossians. It's that he's powerful. He's over all things and he's supreme as well. It's this picture of amazing work of Jesus Christ. I want us to know and live in that tension. Yes, he was all those things. Yes, he was humble and he washed the disciples' feet and he loved deeply. But there's another picture of Jesus as well. And that's that he's powerful and over all things and strong. Which means he's enough for you. He's supreme over your life as well. When Paul says that he's a firstborn, we kind of wonder about that. Firstborn, what in the world is going on with that? 
There was a dude in the third century named Arius who taught people that Jesus was created and that he and his followers were condemned at that point by the first council of Nicaea. If you ever wondered if Christian councils in the early days were important, they were because they were fighting things like that. The reason why I say that, if it sounds strange to you, it's the same thing Jehovah's Witness believe today, that Jesus was created by God. But this is not what Paul is saying. Instead, he's taking the rich history of the Old Testament. He's saying that the firstborn is a sense of preeminence, of supremeness in the family. If you know the Old Testament at all, you know that the firstborn of a family was the most important in the family. They got the inheritance. They took care of the family, did all of these things. We learn in Exodus 4.22 that God calls Israel his firstborn son as well. Moses is supposed to go to Pharaoh and say, let, my, let God's firstborn son go away and get out of Egypt. Then in Jeremiah 31.9, it also gives that picture as well that God's people are his firstborn son. But here's the crazy thing. Us, humanity, failed miserably of being God's firstborn son. You know that? We didn't live in that place of preeminence before God. We were sinful. We were broken as people. And so we needed a substitute. So along came Jesus Christ, who is called the firstborn son, to be our substitute, to be the ultimate firstborn son, to give us, as God's people, new life. Firstborn implies this sense of honor and leadership. And so we see this poetic idea showing up here in Paul's language that the firstborn means that Jesus is the best. He's supreme over all things. He's using it metaphorically as the Old Testament does. Another way to show that Christ is supreme is that Paul argues that Christ is the head of the body, the church. He's over all things in the church there in verse 18. What this means is that the expression of the church that we as a church develop is a declaration and demonstration of what we really believe about Jesus and his gospel. It's no wonder we often say around here that we want to make Jesus look good. We want Jesus to be the main focus of Imprint Church. In other words, we say it this way, Lord, will you help us to make much of Jesus every single week here we meet? Whether that's in our groups, whether it's in our gatherings here on Sunday mornings, we want to make much of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's supreme. He's the head of the body, the church as well. Whenever Jesus' supremacy is removed from a church, so I believe the grace of God will also be removed from the church. It's actually why I believe we have churches dying and mainland denominations kind of falling out because they've stopped making Jesus supreme over all things and they've made other things more important. But here in Imprint Church, man, hold me accountable on this. Hold our leadership, our elders, our team accountable on this. If it ever turns to anything except Jesus Christ, him crucified, the gospel message, we have blown it. And be mad, like yell at us, if you will. Say, we got to go back to Jesus, his preeminence. He's supreme. You told us on this sermon on September 23rd that Jesus is supreme. Always make it about him. And we see Paul lays it out here for us in Colossians, this beautiful picture. This means that no other spiritual power or authority is able to bring about salvation for us. And what happens here is that we see Paul is trying to tell us how our lives should be defined. The battle for your life should be make Jesus supreme over all things. We know what's probably happening in the in the town of Colossae at this time, is that there are Christians who are probably kind of denying that Jesus is that important. Maybe other things have came up in the church and and they're starting to look around and say, yeah, Jesus is important, but we're not sure if he's the absolute best. And it's for this reason that Paul says, no, 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 he is over all things. Do you see how many times even the word all shows up here in Colossians 1, 15 through 20? It's an amazing picture. For by him, all things were created. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things. In him, all things hold together. All, all, all. He is all. And this is the picture that we need to have for our lives. That Christ is supreme. Let's read on in verse 19 and following. I'll read verse 19 again because it will give us the second picture of Jesus today as well. For it says this, For in Christ, in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, 
in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a minister. Like I said, what I think may be happening in the context of this day is that Christians at some level within the context of the church may be denying the sufficiency of Christ for all their needs. Spiritual, emotional, psychological needs, all of those things. And in that reason, Paul says, wait, don't forget to go back to the foundation of the gospel. He does what every pastor should do on a regular basis. He urges the Colossians to remember who Christ is. And on such a basis, he calls them to remember what Christ has done for them with this astonishment that we were once alienated and hostile towards God, but he has brought us near. Even though he's king over all, he's supreme over all creation, and he's preeminent in all those things, he also has given us a relationship with God, which is an amazing thing. We find that, I think, in our own lives, we tend to look anywhere but Christ for fulfillment. Some obvious sins are true to many of our experiences, whether that is something else in our jobs, whether it's a sexual experience of some kind, whatever it is, we fill in the blank and say, this will fill me up, this will make me healthy, this will make me happy, or whatever it is. But here is Paul saying, no, Jesus is what you want. What you're looking for is the work of Christ. And our fulfillment in that way comes from Jesus Christ. And what's amazing here is he says that there are two ways in which a human stands before God. He says you have two options, which is not the best thing to say in a modern progressive culture. To say that you either are alienated from God or you're reconciled to him. But the funny thing is I'm not saying that. Paul is saying that. And it's the picture of who Jesus is. Not only is he supreme, but he's made a way for us to either be alienated or reconciled to God. No one in this room has a neutral standing before God. Not me, not you. You're either alienated from him in your sins and broken and finding your supreme joy in other things or you're reconciled to him. And he is working to become the greatest treasure in your life. Those are your options as a Christian. Those are your options as a human being. And Paul says this to us and reminds us that we can either be alienated from God or we can be reconciled to him. It's a good reminder for us as we come into church today. To even as you sit there, I don't, I don't know if you've come to faith in Christ. I don't know if it's been real to you. And you've ever said, yeah, I, I believe what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for my sins. And you've made that part of your own. But if you haven't, you have to hear me this morning. Christ wants to be supreme in your life. And he is either in a spot of alienation from you or he's reconciling you to God. Those are the options you have. When we respond to the Lord in a few minutes and sing some songs, if you are in a spot of alienation from God, may I urge you to come and be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. It's as simple as saying, Lord, I need you. I want you to be supreme in my life. I want you to be over all things. And I want you to be the supreme Lord. And I want to fight that battle. It's not always going to come easy, but I want to fight that battle now. I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. That's what it means to have a relationship with God. And that's the beautiful picture of what Paul is telling us here. Now there's an interesting condition as well. Because in verse 23, he says you can be alienated and reconciled, but there's a condition there as well, which is always shocking if you're reading the text. Because Paul says... If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. In other words, you can't just at one time receive the gospel and then move on from it and say like, oh, I received the gospel 30 years ago. Everything's fine. Del Riley could have done that, my, my grandfather-in-law. He could have said, oh, I received Christ after World War II and, and I'm a Christian and now other things are more important. He didn't. He allowed Jesus to be the supreme treasure of his life and continue to live that out each and every day. Because Paul reminds us here, if we continue in that faith, being stable and steadfast in all of those things, to not stray from the hope of the gospel. In other words, we don't turn to another hope at all. We stay with the hope that the gospel sets before us, that there is no hope outside of Christ. We don't find some ritual meaning outside of Christ. We don't find some teaching outside of Christ. Rather, we find him as supreme and sufficient for us. Now you might ask me, how does that work out in my complex life? Is the gospel enough for all of my issues in my life? Let me say yes, but let me give you a little hope as well. I want to spend the last couple minutes I have remaining just to talk to you about a few issues that every single one of us deal with in here at some level 
And I want to talk to you about how I think the gospel applies to that situation. If you remain, if you stay stable and steadfast, if you don't move on from the hope of the gospel, I want you to hear how the gospel applies to certain areas of your life. And this, I hope, will set us up for a response time where we hear of the hope of Christ in song and we worship and we receive communion and we receive him by faith in this place. So I'd like to end with several examples of how Jesus is supreme and sufficient for your life as well. Let me give you some ideas here of how this works out. Let me ask you, have you ever felt shame in your life? Have you ever felt shame? You're feeling shame in your life because of something that's happened to you from the past. For example, you're the angry person or you're known as the angry person. You're the promiscuous person or you've been the promiscuous person and you feel shameful. Man, I, I was not a Christian in high school and Facebook freaked me out because all of a sudden I made all these friends who were friends of mine in high school and they're like, you're a pastor? What's the deal with that, you know? And I felt shame. I was like, oh yeah, I had some bad experience in high school, things that I wish I could take back things that I wish I could go back and say, man, I, my life is different because of Jesus Christ. Friends, the gospel says instead of believing we're shamed by that and cannot be seen as anything better, the gospel promises that we are now chosen by God in Christ. This is the gospel idea of election. Ephesians 1 tells us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He chose us before the foundation of the world, that we might be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ according to the purposes of his will. Do you have shame? You're adopted by God through Jesus Christ. You don't have to live in shame anymore. You don't have to feel the effects of sin and brokenness. Jesus can be supreme and sufficient for you. Have you felt condemnation before? Let's think of that. Feeling completely torn down by your actions that you cannot save, you cannot be saved. You might say, God cannot love me because of what I've done. For example, you may have been caught in something. Or differently, maybe you've been victimized by something and you feel condemned because of those things. The gospel says you can be forgiven by God in Christ. Moreover, the gospel tells us that God can forgive you. The ideas of forgiveness in the text, the gospel picture is both these big words. I'll give them to you. Expiation and propitiation. You know what that means? Expiation means that your sin is removed. It's taken from you. Propitiation means that you're given new life. That you're, you're new in Christ. That even though you might feel condemned, you're given new life in Jesus Christ and you don't have to feel the effects of that sin and brokenness. It's best explained in the old hymn, Rock of Ages, where it says, Jesus is the double cure, save from wrath and make me pure. That's what, that's what the gospel does to those of you who feel condemned in here. Do you feel condemned by your sins? Don't forget the gospel. Don't forget what God has done for us. John, 1 John 2, 1 tells us that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but the sins of the whole world. Have you felt rejection before? Who hasn't? Who hasn't felt the rejection of our peers and our family sometimes? How many of us have had horrible experiences growing up? Fathers and mothers, we wish that would have given us the time of day. That we wish that they would have cared for us and loved us well. Or maybe on something more recent. Maybe you felt rejected by your coworkers, by your boss. You feel this sense of deep disapproval and rejection from these people. You never feel like you're good enough. You know how the gospel answers that one? It says that we're accepted by God in Christ, and that's enough. This is the gospel idea of justification. Romans 3 tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. See, the reality is the gospel speaks to our fear of rejection and our feeling of rejection as well, that we can be people that have an acceptance in Christ Jesus. I could go on and on. How many of us have felt lonely in our lives? Some of us believe that we're so unlovable and that there are places in our lives that we're working to fill the holes of relationship in our lives. And we say, man, I, I know Jesus is supreme, but I, I need to have this relationship so I feel complete. But the gospel tells us that we can be adopted as his sons and daughters, as we've seen. This gospel idea of adoption it's why I think gospel, the gospel idea or just adoption in general is one of the most beautiful pictures of the gospel. We see people in our church who've adopted kids 
And I look at that and I go, that's the gospel right there. A kid who is chosen out of the entire world to be the treasure of a family. That's what the Bible says that God did for us. He adopted us as sons and daughters. In Romans 8, we're told that we're given a spirit of adoption as sons. And by that, we cry, Abba, Father, God, Father, Daddy, help me. It fills our loneliness in our lives in an amazing way. How many of us feel abused out there in our lives? Moreover, how many of us have been abused before in our lives? You've experienced physical, sexual, some sort of abuse that has defined your life. What's amazing is the gospel says that you can be made new. That if you feel defiled in some way, shape, or form because of that, the gospel gives you hope that you can be made new as a person. Titus 3 tells us that by the loving kindness of God, our Savior appeared, washing and giving us regeneration, renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out to us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. This is good news. Jesus Christ is supreme and sufficient. How many of us have felt addicted or enslaved to something? Or maybe that's you right now. You feel addicted and enslaved to some sin right now. Maybe your life is characterized by a secret sin that if your family, your church, your business, whatever knew about that, you think everyone's mouths would drop open and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe that person. There is one God, one mediator between God and man. The man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. The gospel idea of redemption tells us that we can be saved from our addiction, from our enslavement. That we can have hope in the middle of all those things. There's so many more. I could go on and on. Now friends, this doesn't mean it's not going to be a battle to get this stuff into your mind. In fact, it is going to be a battle. Remember, that was my thesis at the very beginning of this whole sermon. The main battle in your life is to put the gospel and Jesus above all of those things. What I'm not saying is the gospel is going to solve your complex issues in your life without a little bit of work. It may require counseling. It may require various things in your life. It may require you jumping into a group to be a part of it and working through. But here's the amazing news of the gospel that God is patient with you and wants you to walk that life out of learning how to apply the gospel to your life. It means that you might need to use other people in your life to work through things to see how the gospel applies to that specific part of your life. It might not be as simple as someone in your group saying, everything will be okay, brother. You know, all things work together for him who called you. But you've heard that Romans 8 scripture before. It may not be as easy as that. It may be more difficult because the main battle in your life is to see Jesus as the supreme treasure in your life. So as we work the gospel out in our life, we find that we have to think through these things and process these things and, and allow God to use common graces in our lives, which is sometimes other people, sometimes spouses, sometimes friends, Sometimes other folks that have come along in your life in some supernatural way to help you apply the gospel to your life. I mean, there's all kinds of things, friends. There's medication sometimes that even needs to happen on things like that. There's no shame in these things. Do you feel that? It might help you apply the gospel to your life. So don't hear me that I'm just saying the gospel and just speaking a verse over your life is going to fix all your problems. It's not that. It's something more deep than that. It's actually allowing the words of the gospel to be so important. I, I actually think this is what it means that if we continue in the faith, if we continue being stable and steadfast and secure in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now in closing, I want to finalize with a thought before we jump into our response time. It's another angle the Bible gives us about all these things I talked about. See, the gospel not only says that we have what we need when we feel unworthy or when we're not allowing Jesus to be the supreme treasure in my life. But the Bible also tells us that we have a Savior who's experienced all these things as well. What I mean by that is that if you feel shame, Christ was shamed. If you feel condemned, Christ was condemned. If you feel rejection, Christ was rejected. If you feel lonely, Christ was abandoned. If you feel enslaved, Christ defeated death. If you feel impure, Christ descended to pray for you and is praying for you right now. If you feel hopeless, Christ will return and bring you home. And if you die before that day, you will see him face to face and he will be the supreme treasure of your life. All these promises of the gospel for our lives 
And I am convinced that the gospel becomes in that the power to transform us. So allow yourself to make the supreme battle of your life to make Christ all things supreme and sufficient for you in all of these things. I'm not saying it's not going to take work. In fact, I said just the opposite. It might take work, and I would believe it does. I've noticed it takes work for me, and I'll just be honest with you. I don't believe the gospel every day in some of these areas of my life. It takes work to actually fight that in my own heart and in my own mind, and we are called to the same battle today. Friends, we get a chance to respond to the Lord this morning. As we do, we're going to sing some songs. The band's going to come forward, and we're going to lead you in some worship. And my encouragement for you is to ask the Lord to help you fight this battle, to see the gospel as supreme, to see Jesus as supreme and sufficient for all those things. And as we sing the songs, you're welcome anytime to come forward and receive communion. There's tables in the front. You can take the bread and dip that in the bread and receive, or dip, dip that in the cup and receive that by faith. We don't do communion here just as a tradition. We do it as something meaningful. Or if you believe in Jesus today and you've received the gospel, you're reminding yourself of the gospel as you come forward and receive that. As you come, the Bible tells us to do this in remembrance of Christ and the new covenant he's offered to you. And as you take that bread and dip that in the cup and receive that by faith, it's a way for you to proclaim the gospel is enough for you. And so you can do that any time during our songs that we sing. There is a gluten-free option over here if you need that to have that option for taking communion. You can come forward and give. There's baskets on the tables. We don't pass baskets here at Imprint, but rather we have people come and give as an act of worship. Christ is sufficient to provide for all our needs as well. And we're so grateful for the work of ministry that you're providing. Things like these, these kids that we're providing meals for in Africa and all that stuff. It's amazing to see your generosity. And so please continue to give generously. You can pray. You can spend some time praying right where you're at if you want to. Take some time asking the Lord to reveal the sides of the gospel that you need to understand and, and make part of your life so you actually understand what that looks like. And pray for that. Pray that the Lord would be the supreme treasure of your life and sufficient for all your needs as well. But as we sing, I would encourage you to think about the elements of the gospel that you need to apply to your life today. Fight that battle right here this morning before you leave and allow Christ to be seen as ultimately beautiful for all your life. Let's pray about these things. God, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I, I pray that you would help us, Lord, now to take these words, to remember how important the gospel is and how important Christ is and all the things that he's done for us, Lord. And I pray that as we, as we wrestle with our own complex lives and the things that are going on, Lord, that you'd help us to see how the gospel answers our questions, see how the gospel actually applies to our specific lives. And Lord, may you help us to do that hard work of making you the ultimate treasure, Lord, I pray. So Lord, may we see the, the glorious picture of Colossians 1 working out in our lives now. Lord, I pray that as we respond to you now, that you would meet us in this place, that by your Holy Spirit, you convict us of sin that we need to be convicted of, that you draw us to you and remind us of the adoption that we have as your sons and daughters. Lord, we love you, we worship you and respond to you now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.